Good morning, my name is Roger and welcome to Bushel Park Community Church 10 o'clock service. Now what's the best way to get to know somebody? Well surely it's by communicating, it's by speaking, it's by listening. Then you get to know the person, then you get to build a relationship with them. So I could tell you a bit more about myself. So I've just said my name is Roger. I can also tell you that my birthday was yesterday. If you put me on the spot, so I can tell you that my favorite food is bangers and mash and baked beans. My favorite cake is Victoria sponge. I don't like Marmite. I don't like chocolate spread. Those of you who know me quite well probably think that my favorite sport is football. Wrong. My favorite sport is athletics. And that's the sport I concentrated on in my youth. And I could tell you more and more about myself, but I won't bore you. But that's how you get to know me better. You could also share more of yourself uh, to me or somebody else, and they'll get to know you better. And that's how you build a relationship. But the great news is so that we can get to know God better. In fact, we can get to know God really well because God speaks to us through his word. The Bible is the word of God. And God reveals himself fully through his word. He doesn't hold back. Now, there are many things to learn about God. I just want to concentrate on, on one point right now. I'm going to read some verses of scripture from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. From Psalm 93, the Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. From Revelation 4, there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Now what is God communicating to us? What does he want us to know? He wants us to know, he wants us to know that he rules over all. So we need to listen to him and learn what it means to live under his rule. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing our, our first song. So let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, you teach us from your word that you reign over all. Help us to listen to you so that we understand exactly what it means to live in your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first song, God Sits in the Highest Place. It don't matter what the proud ones say, God sits in the highest place. Even when the wicked ones disobey, God sits in the highest place. You know, God sits in the highest place, full of glory, full of grace. It don't matter what the proud ones say, cause God sits in the highest place. When the liars lie and the haters hate, God sits in the highest place. When the waters rage and the mountains shake, God sits in the highest place. You know, God sits in the highest place, full of glory, full of grace. It don't matter what the proud ones say, cause God sits in the highest place. He's gonna banish sin and shame God sits in the highest place The nations tremble at his name God sits in the highest place You know God sits in the highest place Full of glory, full of grace It don't matter what the proud ones say Cause God sits in the highest place It don't matter what the proud ones say Cause God sits in the highest place Okay, we're going to pray. We're going to pray that we would know God better. We're going to pray that we would share God better. And we're going to pray that more people would come to live under his rule. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, thank you that you have made yourself fully known through your son, Jesus. 
In him we see your great power, love, mercy, forgiveness and justice. All of the Bible is centred on him and he teaches that we worship you through him alone. Help us to live under his rule and therefore your rule. Amen. Father, we pray that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. The good news that Jesus is the servant king who gave his life as a ransom for many. Give us wisdom and a boldness to make him known as you open up opportunities for us individually and as a church. Amen. Father, we thank you that the gospel has the power to save. Save us from our sins. Save us from this broken world. Father, during these uncertain times, please be bringing people into your kingdom, your kingdom that lasts forever. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before Stewie, our pastor, uh, comes to teach us from God's word, we're going to sing our next song, Let Your Kingdom Come. For your renown, the cross has saved us, so we pray your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. who are we Lord use us as you want whatever the test by grace we'll preach your gospel till our dying breath let your kingdom come let your will be done so that Everyone might know your name Let your song be heard Everywhere on earth Till your sovereign work on earth is done Let your kingdom come Let your kingdom come Good morning. It's great to have you with us. My name's Stewie Chaplin. I'm the pastor of Bushill Park Community Church. And let me add my welcome to that of Rogers earlier on in the service. We're going to look at God's Word, the Bible now. And now if you've got a paper Bible at home, please do open up to Hebrews chapter 12. If you need to look on a phone or a tablet, please do. It's great to have the text alongside as I'm speaking. It gives you a chance to check what I'm saying against what a Bible says. Uh, we want God to speak to us as we look at the Bible. And so let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have spoken to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus. And as your word testifies to your greatness, 
and the glory of your gospel. We pray that you would teach us uh, as we hear it to honour you and obey you in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So far in this little series, uh, we've been thinking about a couple of different ways that we might be tempted to lose heart as a church in the ongoing task of gospel ministry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. In the daily challenge of the call to do good to all, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 10. Well, today we turn our attention to another New Testament book with its own contribution to make. It seems pretty clear that the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who were losing heart. We don't know who the author was, he's anonymous, uh, but he spends plenty of time telling his readers not to drift away. Chapter 2 verse 1, we must pay careful attention therefore to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. He encourages them to be diligent to the very end in order to make their hope sure. Chapter 6 verse 11. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. He encourages them to hold unswervingly to the hope they profess. Chapter 10 verse 23. He, he urges them not to throw away their confidence. Uh, chapter 10 verse 35. He tells them not to shrink back and be destroyed. Chapter 10, verse 39. For a variety of reasons, these followers of Jesus were becoming worn down, tired out. They were losing heart. And they were tempted to turn back from Jesus to their previous way of life. What's going to become apparent as we dig into Hebrews 12 today is that a significant factor in the discouragement of these believers in their Christian life was the ongoing presence of sin. Earlier on, the author had drawn attention to the unique qualifications of Jesus which enabled him to deal with our sin. Chapter 4 uh, and verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. He encouraged the church to view repentance uh, from sin as foundational to their faith. Chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore let us leave the elementary teachings of Christ uh, and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. He reminded them that the blood of Jesus cleanses our consciences from acts which lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Chapter 9, verse 14. But he also delivered a solemn warning uh, about what happens if we continue to deliberately sin. This is chapter 10, verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Sounds serious stuff. And the message is clear. If we are God's children, we must not allow sin to have the victory in our lives. We cannot lose heart and give up in the battle against sin. And so let's look to Hebrews chapter 12 and see what encouragement and help there is for this passage in our battle against sin. 
Here's the first thing the author says. Throw off threats to endurance. That's verse 1. Throw off threats to endurance. Roger was telling us earlier on that his great passion is athletics, which is actually highly appropriate in view of our passage today. It likens the Christian life to a race that we are running. Uh, read the words with me. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Picture yourself on the track at the Olympic Stadium down in Stratford. And perhaps to your surprise as you're running along the track, the stadium is full of spectators, people packed watching your progress in the race, a great cloud of witnesses. Who are they? And why do they care about your progress in the race? Well, we only need to look back to Hebrews 11 to see who these people are. Our supporters are the Lord's faithful people throughout history. Uh, from Moses and Cain and Abel and Abraham and so on. Here are God's people who have already finished the race and gone to be with the Lord. But they've not sprinted out of the stadium when they finished the race. They've hung around at the end. They know that when the last competitor crosses the line, God has something very special in store. Just look back uh, to chapter 11 verses 39 and 40. Speaking of these heroes of faith, he writes, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. It's a fascinating thing to say. The cloud of witnesses, they are waiting for you and me to finish our race so that all of us together can receive this better thing that God has planned for all his people together. And so what inspiration are we to take from the cloud of witnesses who have run the race before us? Well, that we are to throw off threats to endurance. Look at the start of verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great, great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Athletes on the starting line at the beginning of a race do exactly this, don't they? Perhaps you've seen it as they're getting ready to, to get on the blocks uh, and they're there. They take off the heavy tracksuits that they've been wearing to keep them warm. Uh, perhaps they've been taking photos to Instagram of the crowd. Uh, they take the phone. They don't leave it in their pocket. They put it in the basket along with the tracksuit. They don't take their wallet and their keys with them on the race. It's only going to weigh them down and slow them up. Anything that might slow them down is left behind when they start to run the race. You see, that it's all got to be thrown off for the sake of completing the race. But more than that, uh, the athletes are aware of things that could trip them up. You often see them adjusting their shoelaces on the start line to make sure they are tightly tied and that they're not going to trip up on it. Uh, there are people who are paid to check the track to make sure there's no trailing ropes or anything left behind that could trip up a competitor so that they don't finish the race. Not a runner at the Olympics would be foolish enough to try running the race with their shoelaces tied together, would they? They know that it would trip them up and they would not finish the race. Well, the same is supposed to be true for you and I as we run the Christian race. We should have the same ruthless focus to identify and remove anything that has the potential to hold us back from following Jesus. It shouldn't be shocking for us to hear that sin is something will have the effect of stopping us from making progress as followers of Jesus. And yet, when we think about it, I wonder how determined we really are when it comes to removing sin from our lives. I know from my own experience as being a follower of Jesus, there are certain areas of sin in my life that I know full well should not be tolerated, and yet I kind of put them off to later. There's other things I'll deal with first instead of getting to that 
thing that I know shouldn't be part of my life. Effectively, we turn a blind eye to the presence of sin in our life and we try and keep it under control when all the time sin is taking control of us. I imagine as you sit listening to me describe it, you know full well what it is in your life that is that one sin that you don't really want to let go of. You don't really want to push out completely. Just try and keep it under control, but you won't get rid of it. Perhaps it's anger or greed. Maybe you're consumed by envy of another person. Or perhaps you're just puffed up with pride. You think, think too much of yourself. Maybe it's that you're unwilling to deal with lust in your life. If we are attempting to live as Christians, knowingly clinging to these sins, we are going to be entangled and tripped up. And our progress is going to be severely slowed in the Christian life. Or worse, we may drop out without even making it to the finish line. But we mustn't stop there. You see, we need to remember that sin is not the only thing that needs to be thrown off. It's not the only threat to our endurance. The author of Hebrews has a wider view in mind. We are supposed to throw off everything that hinders us from making progress in the Christian life. Now, these things are a little bit more subtle. Uh, When you say them, first of all, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, that's a bad thing. They're not sinful by themselves. But there is a possibility that if we think about it long enough, yes, they are holding us back from following Jesus. Let me give you one example. Family expectations of you. Now, the Bible is very positive about family, isn't it? And honouring our parents and that kind of thing. And yet it is possible that our relatives might be putting us under pressure to do things which do not help us to follow Jesus, especially if our wider family are not believers in the Lord Jesus. Constantly organising family get-togethers on a Sunday that they expect you to be at, which means you can't go to church and be with your church family on a Sunday. Perhaps you've had the experience of of family members, well-meaning, but strongly trying to urge you into romantic relationships with people who... God would not have you enter into a romantic relationship with people who aren't Christians. Perhaps even we've known what it's like to be under pressure from our family not to commit to joining a church, not to get baptised as a follower of Jesus. These are all things where uh, family, something which is good, becomes a pressure which slows us down and hinders us from following Jesus. We need to learn. Rather than carrying the weight of those expectations and be slowed down in our Christian life, we need to throw off threats to endurance. Now, if we are willing to throw off threats like those I've mentioned already, then we'll be released to follow Jesus as we should. Listen how verse 1 continues. Let's throw off everything that continues, the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Running the race of the Christian life isn't as confusing or as complicated as people sometimes make it out to be. Back to the the Olympic Stadium, think about the lanes on the track. They're very clearly marked out for you. You just stay inside the lanes, you don't get lost. It leads you all the way to the finish line. You reach the end of the course if you follow the lanes that are marked out for you. The same is true for the Christian life. We will not get lost if we follow in the tracks of those who have gone before us. They will lead us to the finish. We simply need to persevere, to run with endurance the rapes marked out for us. And we will make it. We will reach the finish. That's why it is so important that we throw off threats to endurance in the Christian life. Secondly, Hebrews tells us to fix on faithful endurance. Verse 2, fix on faithful endurance. Perhaps all this talk about running has got you thinking about taking up athletics. 
Now, I could probably give you some instructions on how to go about running, uh, put one foot in front of the other, repeat as quickly as you can. See, yeah, I've explained, you, you've surely got it now. But I think we're probably aware that actually, if you really wanted to know how to run, it would be better for me to get Roger to come in and give you a visual demonstration of good running technique and what it actually looks like to go from the start through the middle to the finish of a race. Far more informative, I would imagine. Well, the same can be true when it comes to our Christian life as we run the race. We've been given some pretty clear instructions about things we need to do, but Hebrews tells us we've also been given a perfect demonstration. Look at verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You could not find someone who is better qualified than Jesus to give us the help and the inspiration that we need to keep running the race. He's the author of faith. Some, some translations put that as he's the pioneer. Basically, they're saying he's not just the one who started it up and, and came out with the idea, who, who marked out the course and fired the starting gun. He's also the one who's leading the way. He's the pace setter. We follow in his footsteps. He's shown us where to go. Jesus is the perfecter of faith, who himself perfectly trusted and obeyed God his Father at every moment of his life, even through suffering, and then obtained perfection for anyone who believes and trusts in him. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, is the perfect person to show us how to live the life of faith. And so what did it look like for Jesus to run the race with perseverance? Chapter 2. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. You cannot miss, as you read Hebrews 12, the fact that the obstacles that Jesus faced in his life were huge. Think about what it meant for Jesus to endure the cross. Having been beaten and whipped, Jesus was nailed to a wooden cross. Slowly and agonisingly, the breath was sucked from his body. And eventually, in great pain, he died. But that physical pain wasn't the worst of it, was it? You see, the Bible tells us that on the cross, Jesus was bearing God's righteous anger against sin. He was receiving the punishment that you and I deserved. And so as we read the, the crucifixion accounts, what do we see? The sky goes black. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus didn't just have to endure the pain of the cross. He had to endure the shame of being killed like a common criminal. He had to endure the shame of being hung on a tree, the symbol of a cursed man in his culture. Jesus had to endure the embarrassment of being defeated by the Romans when he had claimed to be the Messiah. What was it that kept Jesus going in those darkest moments of the race? Well, it was the knowledge that when he reached the finish line, there was joy set before him. Exaltation to the place of honour at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't go to the cross wondering whether the pain and shame was going to be worthwhile to finish the race. He knew that if he endured to the finish, his reward was waiting. Through the cross, there was a crown. Now for you and I, as believers in Jesus, running the race, following in his footsteps, we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. To do what he did. To observe and learn from his model of faithful endurance. 
just like for Jesus, for us. It is the future hope uh, that will enable us to keep going through pain and maybe even shame now. Now, sceptical people will say, that's just wishful thinking. These are empty promises that we can't even be sure if they're true or not. Christianity is just some psychological crutch that will keep people going, the opiate of the masses. But that's not right. You see, the reason we are to fix our eyes on Jesus is not because well, wishful thinking will make the world better. It's because he's made it to the finish line already. And what did verse 2 say about where Jesus was? He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, the seat of honour next to his father. There is no higher place that could be given to him. And Hebrews says, that is where he is now. What greater security could we have now than to know that our saviour is sat in a place of honour next to God? It means our hope is totally guaranteed. So don't lose heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus, on his faithful endurance. Consider the cost of endurance, verses 3 to 4. You see, we reached this point and it, and it sounded like it ought to be the finish there. Jesus sat on his throne, uh, victorious and enthroned at the right hand of God, a heroic triumph. It sounds like a good place to finish, doesn't it? But contrary to what some people believe, the Bible doesn't gloss over the fact that putting this stuff into practice in life now is going to be hard. Living the faithful Christian life doesn't always feel like, I don't know, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. It is hard work. Look at verse 3 and 4. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. For Jesus, the life of faith led to intense and deep opposition. Not from those who were faithful and had it all sorted, but from sinners. Those who, unlike him, had failed to love God and obey his laws perfectly. We all know what it's like, I expect, to speak to people who think that they're experts on a subject, when in actual fact they know next to nothing about it. Well, here is the author and perfecter of faith being condemned by people who were faithless failures. Being rejected by the very people he came to save. That was the opposition that Jesus faced. If ever there was a situation where a person could justifiably grow weary and lose heart, that was it. Hebrews calls us to carefully consider Jesus' response to that situation. What does it say he did? Verse 3. Consider him who endured such opposition. Jesus did not keep up, give up. Despite the cost of living faithfully in the face of violent opposition, he kept going. He finished the race. Now where this ought to hit home for us today is in the whole area of our struggle against sin. Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. We've seen already from this passage that sin entangles us. It, it wraps itself around us. It holds us back. It weighs us down. It is a threat to our endurance as Christians. But it can be painful and costly to fight it. Finances, friends, fun, they all seem to disappear when we say no to sin. This shouldn't come as a huge surprise to us. If sinners opposed our saviour, then opposition will certainly come for those who follow the saviour. 
But if you've never considered the possibility that there may well be a cost to following Jesus, then of course you're going to feel like giving up the second that things start to get difficult. The moment you realise there is a cost. It's hard not to see how catastrophic it will be for our endurance in the Christian life if we become weary and lose heart in the battle against sin. I wonder how many times in the past week you've told yourself, it's too hard. I'm tired of fighting temptation. I can't do it anymore. And you've given in to sin. Now consider Jesus and the opposition he faced on his journey to the cross for his showdown battle against sin. The pressure was greater. The pain was deeper the cost was higher and yet he endured or think back to chapter 11 of hebrews the cloud of witnesses who remained faithful despite the opposition of sinners just listen to a quick description uh, in from verse 35 onwards others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Very few of us are faced with the choice of death or disobedience. This passage challenges us to ask ourselves, are we ready to remain faithful when faced with the cost of discipleship? As they remained faithful when faced with the ultimate cost, shedding their blood in the battle against sin. Sin holds us back from finishing the race. But it is an obstacle that we can overcome if we count the cost, if we don't lose heart, but we endure to the finish line where joy awaits us. Throw off threats to endurance. Fix your eyes on faithful endurance. Consider the cost of endurance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the presence of sin in this world is a tiring and wearying thing. Lord, for many of us, we long to be rid of some of those bad habits that we've, we've brought with us through life. We long to be changed and to leave them behind, and yet... We sometimes wonder whether it's worth it. Help us to see the great value of throwing off anything that is going to hinder us from reaching the finish line. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us follow in his footsteps as we run our race today. And Lord, as we consider the cost of fighting sin this week, Help us to see that we can make the right choices with the health of your spirit. Please keep us from growing weary and losing heart so that we might reach the finish line. Faithful followers of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to finish our service this morning by singing one final song. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. It's a great prayer for us that the things we've heard about from Hebrews 12 would be true in our lives today. So let's sing together. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day by His love and power controlling all I do and say all I do and say may the word of God dwell richly in my heart from out 
to well So that all may see I triumph Only through His power Only through His power May the peace of God my Father Rule my life in everything that I may become to comfort sick and sorrowing, sick and sorrowing. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea. Him exalting self abasing. This is victory May I run the race before me Strong and brave to face the foe Looking only unto Jesus As I onward go as I onward go May His beauty rest upon me As I seek the lost to win And may they forget the channel See